awesome. Um, I apologize for my scratchy voice. I'm getting over the usual uh, fall Seattle respiratory virus. And in fact, if we're lucky, I may be able to treat you to a spectacular amplified coughing fit <laughs> before we get to the end. I'll try not to, though. But um, speaking of spectacular, uh, I have seen some spectacular cell biology in the first part of the day, especially and from people who claim not to be cell biologists. So this is great. This is a great meeting. I am, I'm, in, I'm on the University of Washington main campus in the physiology and biophysics department, and despite the name of my department. I am a cell biologist from way back. And uh, in my lab, we are very much interested in how cells divide. So we're interested in, in all, the, all the mechanical aspects of this process, how the spindle forms, how the um, kinetochores of the chromosomes attach to the spindle, how they move on the spindle, how they line up, and how they segregate with perfect fidelity during cell division. <clears throat> and there's a couple tricky things to studying this process. It, it can happen quite fast. And in fact, these, these are some uh, sand dollar embryos that we injected with um, motor proteins. And they, um, they go through cell division in about 20 minutes. And so it's fast. And it's, as you can see, it's dynamic. And um, a lot of the dynamics uh, that underlie this process are supplied by two main um, so components in the cell. One are the dynamically assembling microtubules. Uh, and that's shown, of course, drawn here statically as microtubules, but um, they, they participate quite a bit in a lot of the dynamic behavior of the mitotic spindle. And then there's also a, a large collection, this is just a small subset shown in this diagram, of microtubule motor proteins. They use the energy of ATP to translocate on microtubules. Some of them actually will modulate uh, microtubule assembly also. And we work on, on both these, uh, these components in the lab, both on microtubule dynamics and on uh, microtubule motor proteins. In fact, we've worked on quite a few that are listed in this, in this diagram <clears throat> over the years. And so just, uh, I just want to take one slide to tell you kind of how we, we operate. Um, much like the Allen Institute, where we get a lot of our data and information from high resolution imaging and live cell imaging. And you know, the first thing we'll often do when we're looking at a new uh, kinesin related protein like KIF18A or KID or KIF4A is localize it in the spindle. Um, and uh, we get some, some baseline information about that. Here's a kinesin that's localized solely to kinetic or fibers. Here's a couple distinct kinesins, both of which are, are associated with, with chromosome arms. <clears throat> and then, uh, so we're interested in the localization of these proteins and then Oftentimes, in order to, to understand their function in cells, we'll selectively deplete them, previously by siRNA. Nowadays, uh, more by CRISPR, we're, getting in, we're going to that direction. And we'll try to parameterize something about the mitotic spindle so that we can measure uh, the effect of the loss of these proteins. For example, here's an easy situation where we're measuring uh, what, what, um, what these molecules contribute to the process of congression, or the lining up of the chromosomes in, at the spindle midzone prior to anaphase. Here's a control cell, and then we can see that when we knock down KIF18A, the chromosomes have more, more trouble lining up at the spindle. Where it's just as interesting sometimes, to, or it can be disappointing though, to, to knock down a kinesin and find it has no effect on congression. But then sometimes we need to uh, knock down a couple motors at the same time, and when we do that, um, when we knocked down KID here and KIF18A, we found we could completely eliminate all directional cues for the chromosomes in the spindle. So <clears throat> this, um, and, and finally, the fun thing about working on motor proteins is that you can actually learn a lot by looking at the motor proteins under the microscope. And so we do a lot of that in the lab. We'll, we'll use turf microscopy to look at um, individual um, dynamic microtubules, since we're not just interested in transport, we're interested in dynamic microtubules. This is one microtubule, and you can tell its polarity uh, because its uh, tubulin has been assembled off either side of a dark seed. You can see that this is the plus end of the microtubule where uh, tubulin dimers tend to add on. This is the minus end. And so we'll use these microtubules, then we'll add motor proteins and determine um, what they do when they reach the end of the microtubule. Do they change dynamics? What direction do they move on microtubules? You can see that here. And, and do, they, um, do, they, do they have any effect on, on, on dynamics? So this is a plus-undirected motor. 
And when it gets to the end of the microtubule, it also affects dynamics. And so, so, so we, we go through a lot of this kind of process to understand how motors and dynamic microtubules function to segregate chromosomes during cell division. <clears throat> so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to tell you about a completely uh, unstudied uh, kinesin. It's about 45 unique kinesin genes in, in humans and mice. And, and some of them are actually, there's very little information known about them. And one of them we selected to work on was KIF25. And it took us into the realm of the centrosome. So, so just to summarize initially, um, during cell division, um, the, the, the cell divides, and then the two, the daughter and mother um, centrioles, they remain in close proximity to each other. They seem to be tethered by these uh, linker proteins shown here. And upon entry into S phase, each uh, mother and daughter will synthesize their own daughter centriole. Eventually, <clears throat> then prior to mitosis, the two newly formed centriole pairs will separate, and uh, they, they, can, they will um, uh, be able to nucleate microtubules, each independent on their own. And then there's a motor protein that has been uh, known of for quite a long time called egg fiber or, or, or KIF11, which is um, actually um, important for separating these two centrosomes and, uh, at the onset of cell division. And this motor protein has an interesting structure. It's a bipolar tetramer, so it has two ATP hydrolyzing motor domains on one end and two ATP hydrolyzing motor domains on the other end. And, and they both walk towards the plus end of microtubules. So if they attach in between two uh, microtubules of opposite polarity, the two heads can walk <coughs> towards the plus end and separate the, the centrosomes. And uh, this, as I said, this, this particular kinesin has been studied for quite some time. We know quite a bit about it. And we have a lot of drugs that can selectively inhibit it. And there's one drug uh, called monastrol. If you put cells in monastrol, um, the cells, this is a cell in monastrol right now. Microtubules are in green, and uh, pericentrin is labeling the centrosomes. Um, this cell, as long as it's in monastrol, can't separate its centrosomes. But then the great thing about monastrol is it's reversible, so you can wash it out. As soon as you wash it out, the cell will assemble a nice bipolar spindle. <coughs> so, <coughs> so we began to work on KIF25. And that's why we became interested in centrosomes, because when we did our first localization of KIF25, it appeared to associate with centrosomes throughout the cell cycle, both at mitosis and also during interphase. Um, so kinesins use the energy of ATP hydrolysis to translocate along microtubules. So we were trying to um, understand how this protein worked. And the first thing we do is take it in vitro, as I said before put it on microtubules under the turf microscope and see what direction it translocates in ATP. And what we found with this molecule is that it lands on a microtubule, shown here, a single molecule, and it will immediately begin to translate towards, translocate towards the minus end of the microtubule. And so this is a minus N-directed kinesin. And all minus N-directed kinesins to date are thought to be uh, homodimers. Um, so we, but just to check that, we looked at <clears throat> this protein in gel filtration. And we found, in fact, <clears throat> its size was con consistent with a bipolar tetramer. Um, obviously, from gel filtration, we don't know if it's a bipolar tetramer. So we got help from the Coleman lab in biochemistry. They looked at the molecule under the um, electron microscope. And sure enough, it looks just like, it look, it looks just like um, uh, KIF11 or egg 5 except for the important fact that it's a minus N-directed motor, not a plus N-directed motor. So we thought, huh, so if this is a minus N-directed bipolar tetramer, maybe it holds centrosomes together. And, and so we overexpressed it in, in, in mitotic cells in monastrol. And uh, then we washed out the monastrol. And the cell <clears throat> has just a terrible time trying to separate those centrosomes <coughs> when there's too much KIF25 around. And uh, my postdoc, Justin Decaro, who did all this work, he looked at a number of different cells, and he found that in most cases, when you overexpress KIF25, you either fail to separate centrosomes or you um, actually um, uh, are delayed in separating centrosomes. To our disappointment, though, since we love studying mitosis <coughs> and the mitotic spindle, when we knocked down KIF25, uh, we found no change in the extent or timing of uh, bipolar spindle assembly. 
So, so we scratched our heads and thought, well, maybe this molecule is useful during interphase. It's on centrosome serine interphase. Here it is shown in green on a super resolution micrograph. Uh, maybe it's involved in, in something to do with um, um, you know, holding the centrosomes together during interphase. And so in order to study this in more detail, we turn to our trusty Nikon biostation. And in this way, we, you know, we can mark centrosomes shown here as these green dots. We can also see in phase where the nucleus is. And so we can actually just watch cells over the course of two or, th or three days. It's, it, the, the instrument is very rock steady that way. And we can, we can determine exactly where the centrosome is during all parts of the cell cycle, when it comes apart, and, um, and when the cell divides, so we know what stage the cell cycle is, the cell is in. And um, what we found is that when we, when we knock down um, KIF25, um, the, the centrosomes tend to pop apart during S phase. And, and so that's nice to know. But the, the odd thing about it is that that's right when it's supposed to have intact tethers holding them together. So this was uh, confusing to us. And another uh, question that we had on our minds is, is this even a problem for the cell? It's well known that delayed centrosome separation is bad for, for segregating chromosomes with high fidelity. But what about premature centrosome separation? Is it a problem for, for cell division? So we looked pretty hard in the cells, and the only thing we could find is that when we knock down KIF25, the centrosome, the spindle is in an oblique orientation relative to the cover slit. <clears throat> And that can be rescued by overexpression of KIF25. And, and as, as, as many of you are aware, the cell has a nice uh, spindle orientation machinery that it sets up uh, on the apical regions of the cell that help position the spindle during cell division. And um, in fact, um, the, these, these, this machinery is set at the apical sides of the cell division, at the cell because the chromosomes themselves actually, actually a RAND gradient emanating off those chromosomes causes a dissolution of the, of the machinery from the mid-zone of the cell. And you can see this in this control cell. Um, here's the, here's the, the chromosomes and here's the machinery on the apical edges of the cell. When you, when you make a chymograph of a movie like this, what you can see is that, um, that the position of the spindle is metastable. So it's, it's, it's pretty stable in the center of the cell, but it's always changing and adjusting just a bit. Um, what we found when we knocked down KIF25 is the position of the spindle is actually quite unstable. And, and, uh, and, and so, and in fact, every time the chromosomes came close to the edge of the cell, the cell orientation machinery melted off the edge of the cell. And so, so, so that was a, a nice piece of information to know. But what we wanted to know also is why is the cell metastable versus unstable? And so we looked around at the geometry of the cell. And the only thing we could see that was different between these two cells and, and these cells that exhibited this behavior is that in this case, uh, nuclear envelope breakdown, uh, the nucleus is right in the center of the cell. And in the, in the case of the KIF25 knockdown, the nucleus seems to be off to the edge of the cell. <clears throat> And so we went back to our trusty bio station and looked at this over the, looked at the position of the nucleus relative to the centrosomes and the, and the orientation of the spindle when the cells entered anaphase. And our data showed that um, um, when you knock down KIF25, you get a large increase in cells that misorient their spindles and they are correlated with having their nucleus off center when they enter mitosis. And so to summarize then, this is what we think is going on. Um, in a, in a control cell, centrosomes separate prior to cell division, spindle forms, and, and for the most part, all is well. The, the spindle orientation machinery can reorient the spindle uh, a bit if necessary. <clears throat> in contrast, when the um, centrosomes separate prematurely during interphase, um, there's a greater chance that the nucleus will become eccentrically located. And when that nucleus is eccentrally located, you'll have a much greater chance of having the spindle off orientation. And I think this, we, we actually strongly believe that this is a general phenomenon that we've caused by knocking down KIF25, but a lot of people see off-center oscillating spindles uh, from a variety of treatments. And in fact, you can, you can cause premature centrosome separation by using EGF, and you can get the same effect. <clears throat> So the last question then is, what about these tethers that are supposed to be holding these guys together all through interphase? <clears throat> well, they've been called tethers because they kind of look like tethers. But um, it, it, there's, it's, 
I like to entertain the possibility that maybe they're an interesting scaffold for a variety of regulatory kinases that might then regulate KIF25 or other, other motor proteins that are, that are actually more mechanically um, um, likely to, um, to be holding those centrosomes together. And the last thing, too, I don't have a slide for this, but the last thing that I want to mention, based on the, all the cool talks I've seen, is, is we've been looking at this in the, in, the, in the Petri dish, but what we really want to look at now is uh, look at this process in organoids and see if premature centrosome separation will really disrupt the formation of an organoid. And so to end, um, this is work that was done by Justin Decaro, who is here at this meeting, and with the help of Juan Jesus, helps us with a lot of an analysis, and Mike w Wagenbach, our technician, and we get help with the EM and some high-resolution imaging, and also high-resolution imaging with GE Healthcare, and I'll stop there. <clears throat> So it's known that when you have too many centrioles or centrosomes in a cell, they tend to cluster at the spindle poles? Yeah. Do you know if the KIF25 has any role in that process? Uh, we don't. That's a great question. We should check it. Uh, uh, right now, you know, I think a lot of people think dining plays a role in assisting with that clustering. Um, it's not at all unclear that KIF25 couldn't actually participate in that as well. So we haven't looked at that. That's a, that's a really good thing to look at. Over here, Linda. Yeah. So, um, it seems like uh, if you had a kind of really well-organized uh, epithelial sheet, that yeah. these oblique uh, spindles would lead to cells, cell actually cytokinesis appearing out of plane, and you might get cells kind of ejected. Yeah. Have you looked for that? No, that's what we need help with from everybody in the audience. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's what we want to look at, because uh, we're, we're very interested in if this has a developmental relevance or, or tissue in terms of tissue, building tissues. <clears throat> Any other questions? I don't know what the effects of overexpressing egg five are. Do you get premature spindle assembly there? And I guess what I'm related to that, what I was wondering then is, can you f find more of a phenotype in your yeah. KIF 25 knockdown if you overexpress? Your question is really good, and you'll find the answer to it amusing. Uh, we haven't done it yet. You would have no idea how long it took us to get a, a mammalian egg five clone. Everybody works on Xenopus egg five. And so it took us about, and finally we had to clone it ourselves. So it took us about two years. So we have that construct now in the lab to, do, to sort of uh, compare back and forth between them. So we're ready now, but it took a, a huge amount of time. There was no place you could get that clone from. It, it was odd, considering how long the protein has been studied. But people tend to study the, uh, the frog ortholog of that protein, I think, a lot. Yeah, so good question. <clears throat> we'll get cracking on that. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much.